Uh, there's, a, there's a running joke um, in my generation, the millennials, which I think most of us are part of, uh, that we are entering our third once-in-a-lifetime crisis, the financial crisis of 2008, the COVID pandemic, um, and now a cost-of-living crisis. Um, people of previous generations will have no doubt experienced much more once-in-a-lifetime um, crisis. We're told it would just be a one-off, you know, tighten our belts, keep calm, we'll get through it together. Um, but as soon as one crisis alleviates, then the next one begins. Uh, a never-ending cycle of toil and hardship. And while these are crises on a global scale, there are certainly many personal crises, job losses, mental health issues, and relationship breakdowns, to name a few. Um, I don't think I'll be exaggerating if I said I suspect some of us to be near burnout. Uh, whether physically, uh, mentally, or spiritually. So what should we do? How should we respond? How do we even begin to handle the dozens of choices we have to make each day? Um, It could feel like we're walking in a tightrope, and any misstep or strong winds could just lead to a disastrous fall. But what I'd like to do today is to explore how we can pray amidst these challenges, to pray to the God who is all-powerful and all-loving, and to pray for each other as we navigate ways of overcoming hurdles. And encouragingly, contrary contrary to what society may tell us, our experience is nothing new. Um, Paul prays for the church in Philippi, facing a similar situation to us today. Um, They had external pressures, such as persecution, um, and financial hardship, as well as internal pressures, uh, such as disunity within the church. And amidst these issues, the church was, was, was praying together, of growing your faith, uh, marked by its um, passion to proclaim and live out uh, the gospel. Paul makes his love and gratefulness for the church extremely clear. Um, if you have your Bibles open, verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. Verse 4, I always pray with joy. Verse 7, I have you in my heart. Verse 8, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ. Why does he pray with such uh, joy and affection? Verses 5 and 6. Because of the church's partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So briefly, what does partnership in the gospel mean? First, we become partners in the gospel when we hear and trust the good news of Jesus. That Jesus, the promised Messiah, God became human as the sinless suffering servant who died in our place, and he rose from death in a new resurrected body. And if we trust in Jesus as our Lord, he will give us a new life, making us right with God. This, this new life marks the first day. And second, our faith is meant to grow in good works. Being partners in the gospel isn't a one-time membership to sign up for, but it's something that's continuously transformative in our lives from the first day. Not that we can save ourselves from good works, but rather that we are saved for good works, to love God and our neighbors, and thereby fulfill God's good purposes. And third, there is an end point. There will be a final day. Jesus will return with full power, with justice for the oppressed, judgment against evil, and renewal, that all broken things will be made new. So knowing that the church in Philippi is growing your faith, leads Paul to pray with joy. Paul wants to pray for them and encourage them in challenging times. So, like Paul, how should we respond to challenges in our lives? As partners in the gospel, we should pray together and for each other with joy. And what should we pray for? Over the next few minutes, I'd like to unpack Paul's prayer in verses 9 to 11 further so that we may observe his desire for the church to grow and persevere. And by doing so, I hope we can make his prayer our own. Um, Paul's short prayer has three parts. He prays for the church to discern what is best. He prays for the church to be pure and blameless. And he prays for the church to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. And if you're here today and you're new to Christianity, welcome. I hope that Paul's prayer be relevant for you and that it would invite you um, to be partners of the gospel and it's so that you two could be divinely encouraged. So first, what should we pray for? In verse 9, 
Paul starts off by praying that dear love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight to discern what is best. There are three qualities here that interact with each other in harmony, love, knowledge, and depth of insight. Love is a know from the Bible. It's not mere emotions that is isolated, but it's something more affectionate in its commitment to action, its unconditionality, and its purpose for the good of others. We think of Jesus laying down his life for us. And here Paul prays that this love will grow more and more um, like water seeping through a barrier, growing in size, um, and eventually breaking through in full force. Knowledge is used in the Bibles. It's not merely academic or emotionless, but intimate. Um, That is to know someone personally. Paul uses this word quite a few times in the context of knowing God more intimately for our good. Depth of insight or discernment, as described by another translation, is the ability to perceive what is good and right from God's perspective. Life as we know it isn't always black and white, uh, but a spectrum of gray. And having discernment gives us the sensitivity to perceive and gain insight across a whole range of situations. So taking these three qualities together, Paul's praying for a love that's passionate, uh, not in superficial sentimentality, but with a loving commitment for God and for others. A love that is not static or stagnant, but grows with maturity, shaped by a greater understanding of God and others. And a love that is not blind, but full of insight across all circumstances. Overall, a love that enables us to discern what is best. And as we know, identifying what is best is often extremely complex. Uh, requires extraordinary, if not supernatural, supernatural discernment. So how, how do we do it? Um, drawing from the rest of Paul's letter, I'd like to highlight a few principles on how we might uh, discern. And these principles are, of course, not meant to be prescriptive or exhaustive. Um, instead, we're meant to chew on them and work through them prayerfully. First, and the most obvious, discerning what is best requires prayer, just as Paul is doing here. Um, For example, as we plunge into a cost of living crisis, how we plan our finances and the way we spend, save, or give is now even more critical. Um, But how do we determine what's the best way to manage our finances? Do we commit these decisions to prayer, or do we only rationalize these decisions in our minds? Um, Elise and I recently had to make a small financial decision and at first glance the answer was obvious on what we needed to do to increase our savings. Um, But through prayer and talking to a church friend, uh, we were both prompted by God independently but at the same time to choose a different option. Um, An option that would mean a lower amount of savings um, but may benefit God, uh, may benefit others more. Uh, We don't know how the decision might work out in the future, but we know that God is fully behind this. Um, Second, discerning what is best in God's eyes might look very different to the world. Paul makes it clear later on in his letter in chapter 3 that whatever were gains to him, he now considers loss for the sake of Christ because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus as his Lord. Uh, One of my many, many weaknesses is that I often start worrying about too many things, uh, sometimes on trivial matters and sometimes uh, less so. But either way, it's so easy for me to worry unnecessarily on things that are valuable uh, to the world but may not be the most important in God's eyes. How should I discern what is valuable and where should I focus my attention on? Well, I think the answer is simply I I need to pray uh, for my love to grow in knowledge and discernment, uh, to identify what is excellent, and praiseworthy in Jesus' eyes. And third, sometimes what is best can be costly and involve uh, involve suffering. In chapter 3 of Paul's letter, he goes on to say um, that he wants to know the power of Jesus' resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Choosing what is best uh, may lead to a suffering that mirrors Jesus' suffering, uh, but also to a glory that mirrors Jesus' glory. Uh, For example, losing a friend or a promotion at work uh, because you offended them by sharing your faith. Or having to make a difficult decision if you're in an unhealthy or stagnant relationship. 
or choosing to forgive someone for a major wrongdoing that has caused a lot of harm to you. So these are just three broad principles on how we might discern what is best. Um, and I'm sure you can think of more examples that we should be considering. Whatever the case, Paul pleads with the church later in the letter to be like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. And he goes on to encourage us to work out what is best with fear and trembling, for it is God who works with us. Discerning what is best requires us to work it out with God as well as with each other. And we should feel liberated, because God is slowly and gradually transforming us to be like him. And we should feel confident, because what God has started in us, he will finish. In the second part of Paul's prayer, in verse 10, he continues praying that discerning what is best may lead us to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. The goal of his prayer is to be presented as morally pure, without fault, and to be sanctified, that is to be made holy in front of a loving God who is completely holy. And I wonder how you felt when you heard the phrase pure and blameless. Um, Perhaps for some, like myself, Uh, It can evoke a sense of fear and anxiety, uh, setting a standard that we're doomed to fail. And my heart is so far from perfect, uh, I can think of at least seven times when I've been far from uh, pure and blameless today. Um, One of my favorite comedies is um, The Good Place, which is an excellent satire on the belief that good people who accumulate enough positive points go to the good place and the rest go to the bad place. And there's one scene where the characters discover that no one has gone to the good place in over 500 years. Um, And then they find that this is because the world has become so complex that any decision people make um, are bound to have a negative impact. 500 years ago, buying a rose for your grandmother would give you positive points. Um, But buying a rose today would give you negative points. You need to use a mobile phone to build in a sweatshop to buy flowers grown with toxic pesticides, um, picked by poorly paid labor, and finally delivered from another country, which increases your carbon footprint. And then we're shown a character who chooses to live in solitude, uh, where he can barely function because he's full of anxieties uh, from losing points, Uh, yet he himself isn't able to go um, to the good place. Uh, This, this of course, isn't the mindset that we should have, um, as though any misstep or miscalculation would condemn us from being pure and blameless. Is that what, I, what I think Paul is trying to um, tell us here is to strive ceaselessly to have a transformed life uh, with a sincerity that is pleasing to God. It's not about accumulating enough positive points as God has already declared us righteous at the first day when we put our trust in him. No, it's about, it's about striving for real change uh, with a growing love, with knowledge, with discernment, uh, striving to continuously put to death sin, uh, be quick to repentance, Uh, and to do right by God and by others. Uh, Striving for a transformed life as children of God, contrasting the world's desires, ambitions, and values. Paul uses the phrase pure and blameless again in chapter 2, encouraging us to shine among the world like stars in the sky, holding firmly to the word of life. And so our, our endeavors to be pure and blameless shouldn't freeze us in fear, but rather it should empower us. God is with us and will give us what we need. Uh, To reiterate, Paul isn't here referring to perfection or sinlessness. That would be legalism. Let me read what he writes further down in his letter in chapter 3. And this is important. And Paul writes, "Not Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul is praying for the church to persevere in purity and blamelessness in view of the day of Christ, the day when Jesus returns in all his glory, renewing heaven and earth, establishing justice for the oppressed, and executing judgment against evil. Not a fictional good place where we will be floating on clouds, but in a new physical creation where we will have new 
physical resurrected bodies. While Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross is the declaration of his victory, his return will be the final consummation and fulfillment of his rule. And in the meantime, we as part of the church are meant to be that manifestation of his coming rule. And so we pray for God's kingdom and glory to seep through us, uh, for us to endure in holiness in view of the final day. And when that day comes, God will take us in with all our brokenness, all our weaknesses, and he will delight in us and glorify us to be like Jesus. In the third part of Paul's prayer, verse 11, Paul describes what our pursuit to be pure and blameless looks like. It is to be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. What should we see when we choose what is best and we aim to be pure and blameless? We should expect to see fruit. The fruit of righteousness, the fruit which produces behavior that is right by God, the fruit that comes through Jesus, that he is the source of all the good in us and all the good works that comes from us. We own our actions and our responsibilities to do good. God works in us to produce fruit. And what a great privilege we have here, that God wants to partner with us broken humans, incapable of escaping sin and doing good on our own. Our entire lives belong to him, from the first day when we accept the good news that Jesus is Lord, to the present as he works in us to produce righteous fruit, and to the very end when we will be made complete. Back to the comedy, The Good Place. Uh, The main characters conclude that because life on earth is too flawed and unfair, a new system is needed. A system where everyone has the chance to collect enough positive points to enter the good place. And so they end up creating one where people take ethical tests after they die, which is meant to mirror the choices faced on earth, but with more fairness and focus on self-improvement. If people fail, they can be re-educated, improve themselves, and then retake the tests until they have enough points to enter the good place. Now, of course, this couldn't be further from the truth in a Christian faith. Perfect purity cannot come from within us, and has to be declared from the outside by God. And bearing righteous fruit cannot simply come from endless re-education. It has to come from a supernatural love that abounds in us. And... Even the notion of what good means in the show is vague, it's abstract. No, we need a perfect example and a perfect representative, a perfect God becoming a perfect human. Our lives belong to Jesus because he is the only one who has lived from conception to death, without sin, without blemish, and with full purity. He is the greatest example whom we have seen and are compelled to follow. And he is our representative, uh, paying the ransom for our impurities and guilt and rewarding us with true purity and blamelessness. Jesus, who is the tree of life, produces the fruit of righteousness for us, and we should remain in him. Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. And finally, the ultimate goal of Paul's prayers is for us to glorify and praise God. God's glory is the ultimate objective, that he is exalted and praised rightfully for who he is and what he has done. It is out of his love that he gives us new life, saving us from sin, diverting us from God's wrath, and transforming us to be more like Jesus. And if we remain in Jesus, we too will share in his glory, completing our joy and compelling us to respond in praise. And so to close as we enter the next crisis, whether a global or a personal one, let's pray. To pray for discernment on what is best, to pray that we may be pure and blameless in view of Christ's return, to pray that we may be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. And what might, what, what might this look practically? Uh, well, I initially considered suggesting a few practical applications for our prayer lives. 
Um, but because we all have our own preferences and strategies, I thought, why don't I turn this around and encourage you to think about this in your own time, to share your thoughts with a friend um, or inspire groups. What are some good prayer habits that we can encourage each other to adopt? And what are some areas that we need to work on? Do we use lists or an app or a devotional? Do we write down our prayers or verbalize them? Um, in any case, I'll, you know, I'll love to hear your thoughts on this and how I myself can better center my prayer life. But there's just one practical application which I like to put forward, um, which can be found in verse 3. That like Paul, we should pray with thanksgiving and joy for each other. How powerful would it be that when we are faced with the great storms of life, God can delight in our prayers and that God can work wonderful things through them and through us. Let us pray. Lord, please instill in us a heart of joy, knowing that you are with us, that you have begun a good work in us, and that you will be with us to the end. We pray, Lord, that you will unite us in prayer, growing in love, knowledge, and depth of insight. That our lives may be marked by purity and blamelessness, forgiving us when we do wrong, and transforming our hearts to do right by you. And finally, Lord, we ask that we may glorify you and praise you, and that you will glorify us as we remain in Christ Jesus. Amen.